It's a pretty basic expectation of most movies that the main villain will end up being killed by the frontline hero. It's the protagonist's duty to take them out after all, yet this isn't always strictly the case. And in a handful of films, we've actually seen the overarching antagonist get done in by a most unexpected character. So following up on our previous video on the very subject, I'm Gareth, this is What Culture, and here are 10 more movie villains killed by characters nobody expected. Number 10, Le Chief. Casino Royale. It's simply expected of any James Bond film that the primary villain gets taken out by 007 at the end, right? But of course, Casino Royale was no ordinary Bond film, as it proved with the manner in which terrorist banker Le Chiffre is ultimately nudged off his mortal coil. After Le Chiffre captures Bond mid-film, he tortures him for the bank account info containing his poker winnings. But 007 naturally resists the abuse, even joking through his pain that Le Chiffre's going to die scratching his balls. Never change, James. And we as fans of the franchise absolutely believe that Bond will get his opportunity to kill Le Chief by film's end. Yet no more than a few moments later, the shadowy Mr. White bursts into the room and holds Le Chief at gunpoint. At this point, Le Chief, who is in enormous debt to Terrace, promises he'll find a way to get the money. But Mr. White simply tells him trust is more important than money and shoots Le Chief square between the eyes. It's a shocking end of second act twist, teeing up Mr. White is a serious threat moving forward, even if this was followed up rather underwhelmingly in sequel Quantum of Solace. We won't talk about that though, yeah? Number 9, Colin Sullivan, The Departed. The Departed's loathsome mole, Colin Sullivan, certainly seemed ripe for a killing by the end of the movie. And those unfamiliar with the source material Hong Kong thriller Infernal Affairs likely assumed that he'd be done in by heroic undercover cop Billy Costigan. But Billy is ultimately and shockingly killed before he can bring Sullivan to justice, let alone kill him. Yet, just as it appears that Sullivan's going to get away with it all, as in the original film, he comes home to find Sergeant Dignam waiting for him in his apartment with a pistol aimed square at his head. Sullivan has no more than a few seconds to accept his impending demise before Dignam plugs him in the head and flees the scene. Given that Dignam disappears from the film a whole 30 minutes before the climax following the death of Captain Queenan, it was a genuine surprise to see him make a vengeful return in the story's final moment. Plus, for anyone who's seen Infernal Affairs, they likely didn't expect Sullivan to die at all, but he did. Number 8, Max, The Lost Boys. The Lost Boys' surprise third act reveal is that their head vampire is none other than the unassuming video store owner, Max. But the movie has one final twist in store for how Max is finally dealt with. Most everyone watching likely assumed that Max would be killed by one of the Emerson or Frog brothers. But just as Max prepares to turn Lucy, Grandpa Emerson crashes through the house in his truck. With fence posts resting on the top of the truck, one of them launches through the air and quickly impales Max, with a minor assist from his grandson, Michael who shoves Max into said fence post. The sheer unexpected awesomeness of Grandpa saving the day is further hammered home by his immortal departing line. One thing about living in Santa Carla I never could stomach, all the damn vampires. Legendary stuff. Number 7, Carl Die Hard. Though Die Hard's ultimate antagonist, the unforgettable Hans Gruber, is of course dropped from the top of Nakatomi Plaza by John McClane, John still had one other foe to deal with. One of Gruber's inexplicably still alive henchmen, Carl. As John and his estranged wife Holly embrace on the ground, Carl emerges out of the plaza and prepares to fire his gun at the pair, only to be suddenly blown away by an initially unseen gunman. Given that John is shown to be taking cover on the floor with Holly, we know it isn't him. But as the camera focuses on the smoking gun, we see that it's John's new pal, Sergeant Al Powell, who earlier in the film reveals that he's traumatized following an incident where he accidentally shot and killed a kid holding a toy gun. Granted, modern audiences likely view Al's redemption a little differently, but all the same, it was still a surprise to see John's moral support character be the one to guarantee his happy ending. Until the sequel, anyway. Number 6, Sentinel Prime, Transformers Dark of the Moon. There was every reasonable expectation that the villain of the third Transformers flick, Sentinel Prime, would be pummeled by Optimus Prime at film's end. But that's not quite the case, at least not without a major asterisk. In fact, Sentinel very 
nearly kills Optimus during their final clash. And he's only prevented from doing so when his apparent ally, Megatron, decides he doesn't want to play second fiddle anymore. Megatron suddenly enters the battle, firing artillery at Sentinel and mortally wounding him. Now, technically speaking, it's Optimus who delivers the final killing blow thereafter, but it's Megatron who disables Sentinel and leaves him as good as dead. More to the point, without his fateful intervention, Optimus would have certainly been killed. It's entirely Megatron's actions which cause Sentinel's death. Things don't go too well for Megatron afterwards, though, as after gunning down Sentinel, he suggests a truce with Optimus, only for the Autobot to promptly tear his entire damn head off. Number 5. Hela, Thor Ragnarok Who could possibly end up killing Thor Ragnarok's villain, Hela, but her half-brother, Thor, himself, right? Except Hela thoroughly has Thor's number throughout their climactic clash, even overpowering him decisively to cut one of his eyes. At this point, he receives a vision of his father, Odin, which assures him there's only one way to defeat Hela, bring about the prophesized apocalypse known as Ragnarok. With the help of Loki, he triggers Ragnarok, resulting in the resurrection of fire demon Surtur who promptly brings his Twilight Sword down upon Hela, obliterating her along with all of Asgard. There may always be a bigger fish, but who among us expected Thor to voluntarily trigger a homeland annihilating event in order to take out Hela once and for all? Not me. Given Hela's power and Thor's realization that Asgard is more than its mere physical location, though, it definitely made a certain amount of sense. And now those Asgard foundations are well and truly gone. Number 4. The Alien Warship Independence Day in a fist-pumping all-American blackbuster like Independence Day, it was reasonable to expect the most epic W to be scored by the biggest star and the most badass hero in the movie. That is Captain Stephen Hiller. Except when one of the alien spaceships is about to destroy Area 51, it's comic relief character Russell Case who swoops in and delivers the save, sacrificing himself with a kamikaze attack in an FA-18, which destroys the alien warship's laser and in turn the warship itself. For a character who was a walking joke to return out of nowhere and lay down his life for the greater good was majorly unexpected, and yet results in arguably the single most memorable and entertaining moment in the entire movie, complete with Russell's unforgettable catchphrase, Hello boys, I'm back! With so many skilled pilots taken out by the aliens, who ever saw this coming, eh? Number 3. Red Parker Jr. Hancock Given that Hancock is centered around a badly behaved superhero attempting to rehabilitate himself, it tracks that he'd surely be the one to destroy the film's primary villain, and his own arch-nemesis bank robber Red Parker Jr. However, in the film's climax, Parker actually manages to get the better of Hancock, but before he can fire a killing shot, he's attacked by Hancock's PR rep, Ray Embry. Ray, now wielding a damn axe, swings the thing down and cuts off Parker's gun-toting hand, before delivering a second blow which kills him. That's a pretty strong showing for a man who is categorically not cut out for this. Like, at all. And for saving Hancock's life, Ray is given quite the insane reward, as Hancock decides to decorate the surface of the moon with Ray's precious All Heart Marketing logo, ensuring literally global publicity for his company in the process. Not bad at all. Number 2. Frau Bruckner Phenomena Nothing anyone could possibly write about will ever top the abject lunacy of Dario Argento's classic 1985 giallo horror Phenomena. At the end of the film, protagonist Jennifer Corvino, ends up facing off against the psychotic, murderous Frau Bruckner, who is enraged that Jennifer has killed her deformed serial killer son, Patau. Just as it seems like Bruckner is going to kill Jennifer, though, she's rescued by a most unexpected figure indeed, Inga, a chimpanzee who isn't at all pleased that Bruckner killed her owner, Professor McGregor, earlier in the movie. In a scene that truly has to be seen to be believed, a razor-wielding Inga hacks away at Bruckner's face until she dies. Even for Argento's gone those standards, this was absolutely wild. And yet, despite the scene's potential to be completely laughable, it's actually a genuinely great, if undeniably mad, way to close things out. And number one, the headmaster, Deadpool 2. The main villain of Deadpool 2 isn't a powered-up supervillain, but a mere flesh-and-blood human. The headmaster of the Essex home for mutant rehabilitation. The headmaster is, in reality, a sadistic mutant-loathing zealot who tortures and abuses mutants for his own sick thrill. And while the movie is largely concerned with Deadpool stopping one of his victims, Russell, aka Firefist, from killing him, and in turn becoming a serial killer in his own right, it's clear that someone is going to end him before the credits roll, right? In the climax, the headmaster emerges from the rubble of his establishment and starts shouting at the assembled hero.
heroes, providing a wide open opportunity for Deadpool or Cable to make short work of him. Deadpool stops a ready and willing Cable though, assuring him that Karma will deal with the Headmaster. And then at that moment, as the Headmaster continues to taunt the group, he's suddenly run over and instantly killed by a taxi driving Dopinder. Even accepting that Dopinder spends the movie desperate to become a killer like Deadpool, his status as designated comic relief made it supremely surprising that he was actually the one to wipe out the big bad. But it wouldn't be a Deadpool movie without expectations getting wildly subverted, would it? Now bring on Deadpool and Wolverine, baby, because we are ready.